Hey everybody, welcome to our Facebook Live. I'm here uh, in Broomfield at the Regenex headquarters with uh, Regenex founder and chief medical officer, Dr. Chris Centeno. Uh, today, we've got a, a great uh, Facebook Live plan where we're gonna talk about uh, PRP concentrations and that PRP really is not really a one size fits all solution for people and what's out there is um, uh, across the spectrum not one size fits all so let's uh, let's talk about that you want to um, like get started on like just what is PRP yeah so PRP is uh, platelet-rich plasma so that means that you're taking blood from the patient and then uh, concentrating their own platelets and their own plasma and platelets have growth factors that can heal. Uh, growth factors are like espresso shots for cells or uh, platelets also have messenger molecules that come out, they even have exosomes that they excrete. Uh, in order to tell the cells in the local area what needs to be done to heal an injury. Um, so platelets are, uh, platelet-rich plasma has been something that's been used for a while and the nice thing about platelet-rich plasma is we have about 70 randomized controlled trials for use in orthopedics right now, including 23 on the knee alone. Um, and in fact, the research is getting so good on PRP that TRICARE uh, just recently announced, TRICARE is the military insurer, that it's going to be covering it for knee osteoarthritis and for epicondylitis or tennis elbow. So that's a huge deal. This is obviously a major insurer, covers several million, million military dependents that's now going to open up coverage. And that's because the research in both those areas, knee arthritis and tennis elbow for PRP is really stout. Yeah. yeah. Uh, better than we have for steroids, for example, for both of those. Right. And many of those studies were uh, put up against uh, HA, hyaluronic acid or steroids. Yeah. So for knee osteoarthritis, We've got PRP is better than hyaluronic acid, which is the gel shots. PRP is better than steroids, which is obviously what's usually used. PRP is better than just physical therapy, exercise, etc. So uh, a lot of good research. So that's, that's PRP in a nutshell there. Stacy, you asked a good question that I was going to ask as well. What is the difference between PRP and platelet lysate? Yeah, Stacy, really good question. So PRP is you keep the platelets whole and uh, you concentrate them. Now, uh, realize that platelets degranulate or get rid of their growth factors over time, so usually about a week. Um, so it's kind of like a time-released pill. Platelet lysate is where we take the growth factors out, all of the growth factors out, and just suspend those in the plasma. So um, it's almost the difference, like the difference between a time-released pill, which is more platelet-rich plasma, uh, versus an immediate release pill, which is more like platelet lysate. So you've got more growth factors on the ground with platelet lysate, uh, but PRP, on the other hand, will get rid of certain growth factors over that first week. So different strategies, we tend to use platelet lysate much more around nerves, where it seems to work really, really well. Um, and we'll use PRP more in joints, tendons, and, and ligaments. And are a lot of those, uh sort of to address your question here, Lamas, uh, sort of one and done, or do some people need to have more PRP for their condition, depending on severity and how they're using their body? Yeah, so PRP is generally used for things like mild to moderate tendon or ligament tears, and those are generally one and done, or they might be repeated once. Um, if you've got something like that's a chronic condition, like let's say mild knee arthritis, then PRP is gonna give you a nice, you know, six to 18 months to even two years of relief, uh, but it will need to be likely repeated. Um, you know, the difference there between that and a steroid shot is that you're helping the knee microenvironment, you're helping those knee cells uh, with PRP, whereas with a high dose steroid shot, you're hurting those cells. So Kevin asks, uh, can a, uh, an epidural help the uh, posterior longitudinal ligament? Not so much. I mean, the posterior longitudinal ligament, so you've got the disc, uh, Kevin, and then you've got the posterior longitudinal ligament on the back of the disc, and then you've got the spinal canal there. 
So an epidural goes around the dura, so it may come in contact with the posterior longitudinal ligament, but it's not really gonna be inside the ligament like you could do if you actually targeted the posterior longitudinal ligament. So um, not, not really, it's not gonna really help the posterior longitudinal ligament very much. Now we've heard this before, uh, this is from Leonard. I had a PRP from someone else and got so swollen I had to go to the ER. It took two weeks for the swelling to, to go down. Is that normal? Uh, it also really didn't help much either. Yeah, so it's, that's a good segue into the types of PRP. So there are two main types of PRP. One is leukocyte rich, which looks red because the red blood cells come along with the white blood cells. And that's a red and white blood cell concoction. So it's a red PRP. Then you've got leukocyte poor, which is more of an amber colored PRP. And it's, it has few red cells and few white blood cells. The leukocyte poor or amber PRP tends to cause much less inflammation. The leukocyte rich or red PRP causes a lot of inflammation. So we generally don't use the leukocyte rich stuff uh, unless we're using it for very specific purposes like inside a disc um, where there's some reasons to add those white blood cells in. Uh, but when it comes to other applications, we use the amber stuff for that reason because we don't like it in calls from patients at three in the morning that have to go to an ER because their knee blew up because of the PRP. Um, uh, Manuel asks, uh, which is better for coccyx, coccyx inflammation, PRP or platelet lysate? I, I imagine that's what you're asking here, Manuel. Yeah, so coccidinia or uh, pain that comes from the coccyx, which is that little tiny bone on the end of the tailbone. Um, you know, frequently we're treating the ligaments around there, so we can use either PRP or a pro-inflammatory version of platelet lysate, which is basically just prolotherapy where we spike it with the growth factors from platelet lysate. So either one of those would be fine. Now, uh, many times we'll do a caudal epidural with that because many times the sacral nerves are also irritated, in which case we'll use platelet lysate for that caudal epidural. Uh, Randy is having his back done Tuesday, next Tuesday with Dr. Cranberg. Is there a maximum uh, number of sites that he can have done uh, with PRP? Yeah, that's something to talk to Dr. Cranberg about, but that brings up another good, uh, another good topic, and that is that what's really different about Regenix sites, if you go into a regular doctor's office to get PRP, it's it's kind of limited as to what they can do. Uh, and the reason partially is because they're using a little bedside machine and kit to do it. So as a result, there's only so much PRP you can produce that way within a reasonable cost. So they're sort of limited to one or two, maybe three sites. Now, my average PRP patient in this clinic sometimes has five, six, seven, eight sites that we're treating, uh, a back, a neck, bilateral knees, a right, a right elbow, a left ankle, a right shoulder. Um, and, and the good news is with PRP, uh, the blood is generally much more of an inexhaustible supply. Now, there are situations where you can run into trouble if the patient's really small. Obviously, you've got to take that into account or if they've got anemia. But one of the things that we do here at Regenix is we've got a blood loss calculator. So the doctor can go in and, and, and the, or the Staff can go in and enter all the orders. I want this much for this joint, and that much for this joint, and this concentration here and that concentration there, and put in the patient's information, their hematocrit, their weight, their sex, and make sure that there's enough uh, blood in the tank, so to speak, to satisfy the orders. Um, and that uses AABB guidelines. So that's a, a web-based app that our Regenix providers use to keep you safe. Yeah, that's great. You know, Megan uh, stated her uh, daughter had uh, uh, PRP in the knees, but it was done through a scope. Like, that's a little overkill, right? Yeah, that's way, way, way overkill. Um, meaning that, you know, there's really no reason to, to go that route. We can do everything uh, that you can do under a scope with PRP, either under x-ray guidance or ultrasound guidance. So that's an injection. So that's a uh, again, just an order of magnitude down on the possible complications that could be caused by using arthroscopy. 
Um, so very little that you can do under arthroscopy that you couldn't do uh, under one of those two guidance techniques. And uh, I'm sorry I didn't get your name, but I um, uh, had stem cell and PRP in the knee a few years ago or maybe 18 months ago and uh, wondering about when is appropriate for a booster shot uh, of maybe PRP. Yeah, generally uh, what I tell patients is uh, get er be early on getting that booster shot when your symptoms just start to return. So the moment you notice, because generally a, uh, if it's a properly done bone marrow concentrate procedure like we do at Regenix, generally if you're a responder, you're gonna have between two and seven years of relief. So let's say it's four years and all of a sudden you start to get a little bit of creak in your knees and you're like, ah, I think it's coming back. That's when you want to get that booster shot done to try to push it out down the road further. And does age matter? Like, I mean, do, do people need a booster sooner or later depending on their age? Doesn't seem to be. Um, we haven't seen any correlation with age and, and that duration of effect. Um, you know, I've seen, in fact, I, I'm going to blog on this guy here because he just sent us an email. I think he's seven or eight years out from his Regenix procedure, still uh, sending us his, uh, I guess he's on the leaderboard for some uh, ski resort where they measure your vertical. And he's got 37,000 vertical feet, so he's number one for the resort at this wow. point. And he sent us the whole list to show that he was number one. So, And, and that guy's like 70-something, so he's, he's still rocking it. And so chronicity, uh, so you've got a more chronic problem versus like a subacute problem. How does that play into this? Yeah, so uh, no, I mean, not, not a problem there. Uh, when it comes to knees, uh, what we tend to do is PRP tends to be used more in mild and moderate arthritis and moderate to severe, we're using more bone marrow concentrate. Um, and so that's, realize that's kind of where that line is and it's more on the severity. Uh, I guess we, we, you may have missed us uh, earlier, uh, Jackie. She asked, what is a booster shot? Yeah, all a booster shot is, is uh, usually if you've had a bone marrow concentrate procedure, a booster shot is a high dose PRP shot to try to push it down the road further before you need another bone marrow. Um, so as an example, you know, usually we do booster shots if someone has had a bone marrow procedure and uh, let's say they're six months out and they're doing pretty well, but they'd like to try to get a little bit more. That's, a, that's some, uh, uh, where we'll do a booster shot. Or they're two years out and their stuff is starting to return. So we're hitting them with a booster shot to see if we can push it down the road another year. That kind of stuff. Uh, Megan asks, have you seen any decrease in recovery time after meniscus repair with PRP injections given during the repair? Any decrease in recovery time? So. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think there's any publication on that right now, um, and uh, we don't do it that way. We uh, so so the answer is uh, what, the good news is I suspect that there's an advantage to using PRP with a meniscal repair because uh, PRP can increase blood supply, and there's at least one study showing that just injecting PRP into a meniscus tear will help repair. So without any surgery being done. So my sense is that that will help somebody. Now as to whether or not it makes the recovery any quicker, I, I don't know and I don't think anyone's ever studied that. Um, Stacy, let's see, lots to discuss. Uh, let's see, when to start a PT after a PICL uh, procedure? Any opinion on what slippage threshold uh, means you're healed enough to start PT? Yeah, it's not so much slippage threshold as it's really, I tell patients, and I'm going to do a blog on this sometime this week, it's on my list of things to do, uh, but I usually tell patients that they want to start physical therapy when they can hold an adjustment for a significant amount of time and when activity is not dramatically increasing their symptoms. So for PICL, we have patients who they can't ride in a car without getting increased symptoms. So obviously that's not a PT candidate. Um, but let's say that person goes and graduates to the point where they can ride, ride in a car without any problems and they can do light housework without any problems. That's a good place to, to maybe start some light physical therapy. But you got to get to that point before you're a candidate for physical therapy. 
Uh, Jackie asks about, uh, she's got severe OA. What do you think would be better for that, PRP or stem cells? OA in the knee. Yeah, so severe OA in the knee is more of a bone marrow concentrate or bone marrow stem cell procedure. Uh, generally, uh, uh, it's not going to respond well to high-dose PRP. Uh, Marty asks about a calf tear. Would PRP be helpful with this? Depends on how big the tear is, Marty. If we're, what we're talking about is a, a partial tear, then PRP can be very helpful. Uh, for what we're talking about is a complete non-retracted tear where it looks like it's complete on the MRI but the, the two parts aren't ripped back, then uh, that's more bone marrow. And if it's a calf tear where the two parts are ripped back and there's a big, uh, you know, a big part down here, kind of like a Popeye type look, then um, PRP or bone marrow are probably not going to help and that's more of a surgical thing. What about partial like Achilles tears? Yeah, we've done PRP. I've got one on the blog uh, that I did many years ago that I actually just saw her back. Um, yeah, she had basically lots of small partial tears throughout the Achilles and um, did extremely well. In fact, we were able to demonstrate an ultrasound that we got rid of all those small, small partial tears. And she wasn't a surgical candidate because no surgeon wanted to touch it. They felt that they would be sewing tissue paper back to tissue paper and it was going to be a disaster if they tried to operate her. Uh, now we, we have a couple other different kinds of, of, of platelet injections. Uh, platelet poor plasma, PPP. Yeah, so platelet poor plasma uh, has been shown to be more effective with muscle repair actually. Um, so that's what we would use if we're treating muscles. Uh, and all platelet poor plasma is, it, it's if you make PRP you'll end up with PRP and PPP, the pore plasma. And the advantage of PPP is it's got some more anti-inflammatory cytokines in it. Um, so in addition, for whatever reason, it seems to promote muscle repair better, at least in the lab. So that's where, where we will use it. Uh, yeah, I had it injected in my hip before I had a labral uh, tear repair, and it was quite soothing. Yeah, it tends to be more anti-inflammatory. Yeah. Uh, Rachel asks if PRP would help uh, be helpful with a disc issue. She's trying to avoid uh, a spinal fusion. Yeah, I mean, we help people avoid spinal fusions all the time, Rachel. Obviously, it depends on your, your situation. We'd need to look at your films and better understand what's wrong specifically. But uh, we'll use platelet-based spine procedures to help people avoid fusions. Uh, we'll end up injecting ligaments, joints, uh, around nerves or epidural, etc. So those can be very, very effective. We can usually prevent the need for a fusion about 80% of the time in those people. But again, we need to look at your films to make sure that you're a good candidate for that. Uh, this is a good question about what is the most powerful PRP. I know we can do a lot different things with the concentration of our PRP versus a bedside machine. Yeah, so if you look at PRP, um, what's really fascinating about it is that, uh, and we started seeing this many, many years ago, uh, one of the things we noticed many years ago was that if you took young stem cells, uh, stem cells from a 20-something, let's say, uh, you could hit them with higher concentrations of PRP, but it didn't really matter, meaning that uh, PRP would stimulate the cells to grow, but in a young person, if you did 10 times concentrated PRP versus just two times concentrated, there's not a big difference. Those cells respond the same. But if you take an older person in their you know, late 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and you hit them with a much higher concentration of PRP, there was a dramatic difference in how the cell responded. So if you, if you hit them with 10 times concentrated PRP, it would work twice as well as five times concentrated. If you hit it with 20 times concentrated PRP, it would work twice as well as the 10 times concentrated. So uh, because of that, we dose our patients with PRP with much higher doses than you can create with these little bedside machines. Meaning you really can't get to a 20 times concentrated PRP using a little bedside machine. Um, so uh, if you're older, you're gonna get a much higher concentration of PRP here. And if we're looking for a better PRP, it's that leukocyte pore, and if you're older, it's the highest dose that you can get because your cells are going to respond really well to that. If you're 20-something, you don't need that. 
Uh, how would you determine if lumbar annular tears were the source of pain? Would this be determined with discography or some other method? Yeah, so we have abandoned classical discography and now use what's called biologic discography. So biologic disco discography means that I'm going to take a high-dose PRP and I'm going to pressurize your disc with that PRP. The concept being, I don't want to stick a needle in your disc and pressurize it to see if it's painful, which is what discography is. Uh, if I'm not going to leave something behind that's going to try to help the disc. Because why poke a hole in the disc and not leave something there to try to heal it? Um, so we don't use classical discography anymore. We'll do biologic discography. Um, and again, for those of you that don't know, discography is a technique where we inject into the disc and pressurize it to see if the disc is causing pain and also it can tell if there's a tear in the disc. Um, so no more classical discography for us. It's all biological, meaning that if I'm going to inject something in your disc, I'm going to leave something there to help it. Yeah, that makes great sense. If, we're, if a uh, PRP injection was done without guidance, it did not go inside the ligaments after a stem cell procedure, can PRP still help, uh, can PRP still help uh, the knee? Um, yeah, I mean, listen, there's, uh, when it comes to PRP without guidance, uh, number one is we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, this is 2019, there's no reason to do it uh, other than laziness on the part of the doctor. Um, now, are there ligaments that you, or tendons that you could treat uh, without guidance on the outside of the knee? Yeah, you can do that reasonably well. You're gonna miss sometimes, but reasonably well. Um, if you're trying to get in the knee joint itself, then you're gonna miss about one in four times. Um, so again, good news is three in four chance it got in the knee. Bad news is there's a one in four chance that you wasted your money it never got in the knee. So that's, that's the reason why in 2019 with the wide availability of education for things like ultrasound, fluoroscopy, the wide availability of those technologies, there's no reason not to do it with guidance other than the doctor's lazy. Uh, Kevin asked, and, and Kevin, I'm sorry, I don't know what this means. If we've used HBOT with stem cells? Yeah, you know hyperbaric oxygen. Oh, gotcha. So, uh, yeah. Um, so the answer to this question is, Kevin, and I've probably fielded it at least 100 times to patients, is that we really don't know clinically if HBOT makes any difference with a stem cell treatment. No one's ever done that research. Having said that, I don't think it's going to hurt. And there might be some good reasons to think it might help. So if you want to do HBOT with a stem cell treatment, I tell patients, go for it. Uh, but I can't give you any research that anyone's ever done to show that it makes a huge difference. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Ryan asks, the number of PRP treatments necessary to maybe stabilize an SI joint? Yeah, so Ryan, when it comes to platelet-based SI joint treatments, we usually do approximately one or two in men and two or three in women uh, would be our average treatments for PRP and SI joint instability. Uh, Randy, uh, who's going to see Dr. Cranberry, asked, I'm going to stop all uh, herbal anti-inflammatories and blood thinners a week before PRP injections. Is there anything else I should prevent taking? Is caffeine okay? Yeah, I think caffeine should be fine. Uh, something you might consider doing is uh, it might be a good idea to fast before you do your PRP. So even something like that Prolon, um, which is out there, that's the fasting mimicking diet where they kind of start you out with 11, 1200 calories, move you down to five, 600 calories over five days. Uh, that would be an excellent thing to try to clean up uh, everything that might go wrong in a PRP, everything from triglyceride levels, etc. If you don't want to do that, then just do, I would probably not eat dinner the night before, not eat breakfast. Uh, so that's kind of like a little, little intermittent fast, and you're going to be sleeping in there too, so you've got a nice fasting window uh, before they draw that blood, um, because all that's going to clean up some of the, the bad uh, and pro-inflammatory cytokines and other things that can come along in blood. I just finished uh, a five-day prolonged fast on Friday, and I took some subjective, like, pain numbers of my own aches and pains, and I, I have to say, uh, it went down about two-thirds. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I've heard a lot of patients who have said that it's helped a lot, especially with the, the more chronic old age kind of aches and pains that we all get. Yeah. Uh, that kind of stuff. So uh, someone asked, when, when would you do a prolon uh, fast? I would do it right before and be, you know, my fifth day of fast when they're doing the procedure. Uh, if you're going to do something like that. If you don't want to take it that hardcore, then again, like I said, just skip dinner the night before. That means you had lunch and then you've got a nice window there of almost 24 hours by the time they uh, take the blood and do the procedure. Uh, so Christina asks, have you seen uh, success treating people with uh, CCI, AAI uh, symptoms? Yeah, I mean, we've got a whole suite of procedures we do for CCI, uh, including that PICL procedure where we inject the ALAR transverse ligaments directly. So we're the only people on earth that do that right now. Um, so that's a procedure that's actually unique to this clinic at Centeno Schultz um, because of its complexity. But we have been treating CCI patients going back almost 20 years. Um, so we treat a lot of CCI patients from all over the world right now. And sort of along the same lines, and I apologize, I don't remember your name here, but uh, thoughts about using moist heat with infrared uh, versus just uh, infrared for uh, CCI type post-treatment care. Um, yeah, I don't know that moist heat is any better with infrared versus just infrared alone. Um, the purpose of both of those is to try to increase local blood flow. Uh, infrared is going to get much, much deeper than just applying moist heat to the surface. So um, I think it's the infrared there that's the good part. Yeah. Um, someone uh, liked your blog this morning on vagus nerve and um, wondered uh, with cervical spine instability, upper cervical, does that, does that nerve really ever heal? Yeah, I can tell you that we see patients who... Um, who get a lot better with that anxiety, for instance, that seems to be very, very common, um, and their tachycardia, meaning their rapid blood uh, heartbeat. So realize that you know, if your vagus nerve isn't working, you get into that fight or flight response, and that by definition is rapid heart rate, you know, lots of adrenaline, um, and you know, basically something that we would all call anxiety. So uh, we do see that stuff go down and moderate as patients get better. Uh, because realize, like I said in the blog this morning, you've got a little hole called the jugular foramen where the vagus nerve exits, and then it goes right on the side of that C1 uh, atlas or vertebra. So if that C1 is going out towards that side, it's gonna piss off that vagus nerve, which is gonna inhibit it, which means that fight or flight response. I've seen some uh, reports that some of the, you know, since the vagus nerve goes into the gut, that some of the, the gut microbe migrates its way back up. Oh, migrates? Through, through the nerve. Oh, see, that's, that's really interesting. I'll have to look up that one and do, some, do another blog on that one. But what's really interesting there is, is that we also have CCI patients, for example, that report gut issues uh, when, they're, when they're out. And obviously this vagus nerve would explain that because it does go into the gut. It does change your gut motility because remember in that fight or flight response, you shut down your gut. Um, it just shuts off because uh, you want to mobilize for, for movement, which is the opposite of being relaxed or sleeping when you're digesting your meal. Uh, Lamas asked a couple questions here. What do injured ligaments look like on MRI and do most uh, CCI patients come with normal MRIs? Yeah, you know, MRI for craniocervical instability, that's just so everyone listening knows what that is, CCI. Um, that's when the ligaments at the top of the head or the ligaments hold the head on uh, are damaged and things are moving around too much. Uh, but MRI is kind of a two-edged sword when it comes to CCI. Um, Movement-based MRI can be very helpful for us as we look at what's going on. So for instance, uh, the grab oaks measurement, which is how far the dens is going back towards the brainstem, that can change on a flexion and extension MRI. Um, so movement-based MRI is great. Now, just regular static MRI tends to be less helpful 
because if I see a change in signal on the ligaments, let's say the alar ligaments, uh, I need more information than that, like movement-based imaging to confirm that that's really, that really means a loose ligament. Of all those different things, the most helpful is actually DMX. Then at digital motion x-ray, where we're looking at things move. So if, you had to, if I had to pick the two most helpful things I see, it would be a movement-based MRI and DMX, and having those two things, I can almost always get to a diagnosis. But having just a static MRI, even of the, the right area, which is unusual to find, meaning most of the regular static cervical MRIs are only gonna be in the lower part, they're not gonna be at this area, um, is less helpful. And uh, with cervical instability, and, and if somebody doesn't respond, do they end up going on for surgery? Because uh, Christina is here is trying to avoid surgery. Yeah, so there's nothing we're doing that's going to make surgery any harder or make surgery uh, not work, etc. cetera. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, they can go on to surgery. Now, thankfully, um, the vast majority don't. Uh, go on to have surgery, but it's, it's something you can always do. The problem with surgery is you can't go backwards. So when I see surgery patients that have had fusion, there is no going back from that fusion. Um, it's a one-way street, meaning the damage done by the surgery is significant, and then even if you take everything out, the damage that remains is significant. So there's no going backwards from surgery. It's a one-way street, an irreversible decision. Hence, you want to try everything you can before you get there, that's reversible, meaning there's nothing that we're doing with this procedure, uh, unless there's some sort of untoward complication, which hasn't happened yet, uh, that's gonna prevent anyone from having surgery. But if you have surgery, I can't do this procedure. So that, that's the problem. And you shared some MRIs of just crazy surgeries where screws have been in oh, yeah, joints CT and yeah. so, CT. Yeah, so the C1, C2 screw fixations in particular, where they put the screw through the C1, C2 joint, um, and even upper cervical fusions in general, those screws are really hard to place. Um, and the anatomy in many of these patients is not really normal or even the, the same from patient to patient. So we're seeing screws get placed in all sorts of places they shouldn't be, and that's causing lots of other problems. Uh, Shannon asks, how long after stem cell treatment can you, uh, should you wait before having some atlas orthogonal care? Yeah, so, so literally I tell patients to wait a couple days, but, if, but uh, I'm going to give a caveat to that. You have to be the kind of patient get, that gets substantial benefit from upper cervical manipulation. Uh, so again, we're talking about CCI now. Uh, so if you're that kind of patient who you get put back in and you feel great for some period of time, you can start that day two or three after your procedure. But if you're that kind of patient that gets, quote, put back in and it never really seems to work, I wouldn't do any of that type of treatment after the procedure. Uh, so Blake wants to travel uh, 11,000 miles from Australia to come see you for the PICL treatment, but... Uh, not ready to do that yet. What uh, things do you recommend people with CCI do to help manage these conditions? Hopefully we can see you if necessary too, Blake. Yeah, so uh, some of the things that work, uh, that I, obviously upper cervical manipulative work, atlas orthogonal, uh, NUCA, those sorts of chiropractic treatments, if you find the right doctor, can be very, very helpful. Uh, for a lot of patients. Um, sometimes upper cervical facet injections can be helpful. So you've got to find a doctor down there who does C0, C1, C1, C2, those sorts of things, meaning high upper cervical facet joints. Uh, posterior prolotherapy might help a little bit. Uh, so that's focusing on these ligaments back here that are easy to reach. So those are the three things that we have seen provide some relief. Uh, Debbie asks, you ever worked with equine vets in regards to your research on PRP for thoracic spine issues? My horse had narrowing between the vertebrae, between two vertebrae, did cortisone. Uh, she ended up having her low back and, and shoulders and elbow done with Dr. Newton and Schultz. The vet was unaware of the positive outcomes of PRP and spinal issues. Yeah, so that's an interesting thing. And I think a lot of it uh, from, so listen, we've worked a lot with Colorado State University the CSU Translational Medicine Institute. 
and they do their equine vets. Um, and they've been doing stem cells and equine uh, athletes going back 20 years. Um, what's interesting is that PRP or any work in the spine is much, much less common in equines. Um, so one of the things that CSU has done is actually there's an endowed chair now that's held by, her first name is Mindy, but I'm blanking on her last name, a vet up there who's a researcher. And what she's trying to do is to open up the world of, of equine spine. Uh, and I've talked to her many times, and it is so much more difficult than what we deal with in humans. Just getting uh, a fluoroscope that could punch through and see the spine, for example, is almost impossible. Um, getting a CT scan for a CT guided procedure is very difficult, obviously due to the size of the horse. Getting uh, ultrasound to work in the spine is a little bit more difficult than it is in humans because of the amount of tissue you're going through. So she's having to try to invent an entire field up there. And it's one of the few places on earth where they're doing equine spine. Um, so equine spine right now is, is decades behind human spine work um, because of all of those practical issues, but they're working on it up at CSU. Gabby, thanks for reposting this. I meant to get to it. What causes the muscles in the front of the neck to tighten with cervical instability? Yeah, so those are usually the sternocleidomastoid muscles, these big muscles up here, or the strap muscles under the chin. And um, literally, so if you look at the sternocleidomastoids, the sternocleidomastoids are one of the main uh, muscles that turn your neck and your head. Now, the, the main joint that turns your head is C1-C2, which is a common uh, problem joint. So s these muscles have to work in concert with C1-C2. So if you've got C1-C2 problems, the sternocleidomastoids start to freak out. They're trying to stabilize the C1-C2, even though they're not built for it, because it's not being stabilized up here. So the big muscles tend to freak out when they see spinal instability, and you get a splinting effect. Literally, it's your body saying, I don't know what's going on up there, but I'm getting all sorts of messages that things are moving around and they shouldn't be, so I'm gonna clamp down in case that helps. And that's generally what happens with those big muscles up front. In traditional pain, I've seen them just like uh, use um, what like Botox to loosen up tight muscles, and I've seen that backfire. Yeah, so if you've got instability, Botox is generally not your friend, right? Because the, ins the, the muscle tightness is making you more stable. So if you artificially take that muscle tightness away by loosening the muscle with Botox, uh, that is not good. And the problem with Botox is it, is it lasts three months. So it's not like taking a muscle relaxer and saying, I'm never doing that again, and just don't do it the next day. If you do Botox, you're unstable, more unstable for three months at a clip. Uh, let's see. Uh... Okay. Uh, I, there's one other form of uh, platelets we use I don't think you talked about, the PLM? Yeah, that's plate lysate. So PLM oh, okay. is gotcha. just a high-dose platelet lysate. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I saw a question roll by here. Somebody had a cervical injection, C3-4, uh, a while back, got good results. Symptoms are starting to come back. Would you repeat that sort of treatment? And if I didn't get that question right, please repost that. They had what now? Uh, 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 PRP, platelet lysate, C3-4 for arm pain, and got uh, symptom relief, and I think the symptoms are coming back now. Yeah, so, so a couple things there. One is you want to make sure that you get a whole spine type approach there. So generally, we'll no longer just inject around the nerve, we'll inject uh, in, around the, into the ligaments, the muscles around the nerve to try to stabilize that degenerative area. Um, so yes, normally you would repeat that, but you want to make sure you're getting a whole spine approach, not just focused on, on calming down the nerve. Uh, Stacy uses uh, Valium periodically when things tighten up in the upper cervicals. Um, is it okay to use as long as she's laying down because she feels like it really does loosen up the muscles? Yeah, just realize, Stacy, that Valium is pretty addictive. Um, all those, it's a benzodiazepine, so there's an addiction potential there. So just be very careful and only use it occasionally, but that's that's fine if you're only using it occasionally and can manage it. All right. Well, we have had some great questions and conversations on PRP. As Dr. Centeno said, there's so many good studies on it available now, 
and yeah, and, and one of the things I'd like to leave you with is that if you're looking at a regenerative medicine clinic, again, we, we've been doing uh, stem cell work in orthopedics longer than, than anyone else on earth for many, many different things. But the thing I'll tell you is that a good clinic, uh, one of the ways you can tell a good clinic that's doing good work is they're going to do about two-thirds at least PRP for every stem cell procedure they do. So they're usually doing two PRP procedures on patients for every stem cell procedure they're pulling the trigger on. And it can go as high as even three and one. So if you're walking into a clinic and all they're offering you or talking about is, is stem cells this, stem cells that, stem cells this, that's amateur hour. Um, you, number one, you're probably not even gonna get live stem cells because very few of those clinics actually even offer a live stem cell product. But number two is it's amateur hour because there's so many things that can be taken care of with PRP. And I always tell my patients it's my job to choose the least expensive, least invasive thing that's the most likely to work. And oftentimes that's PRP. Um, and so someone walk in and I could have charged them $10,000 and all we charged them was $2,000. That's my job. My job, any good doctor's job is to use the least expensive thing that's the least invasive, that's the most likely to work, and a lot of times that's PRP. Uh, Susan, I want to make sure we get this question answered for you because I think it's an important one. Uh, her husband had PRP done in his torn Achilles, 30% tear. The podiatrist put him in a boot for a month, and the first uh, two weeks non-load bearing with no physical therapy at all. Is that normal? His range of motion is not good, and, is very, and uh, it is very weak now, but his Achilles, Achilles feels much better. Yeah, we generally don't boot those patients at all. Um, we would generally have them have an active recovery. Um, if anything, you know, if they were in a lot of pain, we might boot them for a week at most. Um, but that's more of a surgical approach. You have to realize when you're dealing with a surgeon, which a podiatrist is a foot and ankle surgeon, they're going to take a surgical approach, which tends to use a lot more immobilization and there's a lot less understanding of how to use these less invasive therapies. Um, so no, that's not common. Uh, for someone who did this all day with a 30% partial tear, we would not boot that person at all. Um, we would uh, allow them to have a more active recovery and just listen to their body for the very reason that you bring up. And that is that you're gonna lose not only strength, but you're gonna lose range of motion more importantly. And then the foot and ankle getting back that range of motion sometimes requires an act of God. I mean, it's really, it can be really tough to get that range of motion back once you lose it. All right, one more question. These uh, good ones keep coming in. Uh, how about uh, PRP with uh, uh, sciatic pain at, uh, due to an L4-5 disc? Uh, would that be helpful? Yeah, not so much PRP, but play the lysate. Um, so... Uh, if you go to a regenerative cl clinic, uh, they would use a platelet lysate epidural to treat that. Um, but again, probably a whole functional spinal unit approach or a whole spine approach where we would also look at where the ligaments are, are loose, whether the muscles need help, the joints, etc. So not just the epidural part, but a whole spine approach. Great. Well, this has been very good, very instructive, very informative. Yeah. Great questions. Thanks for participating. Um, we'll be back next Monday, 4.30 Mountain Time. And I think the Monday after that, we're out, right? Uh, yeah. Because you have uh, yep. something going on. Okay, uh, look forward to seeing you next week.